My name's Oliver Emberton. I'm the Managing Director of Silk Tide. Right, let's get started. So how should your navigation look? Firstly, what's wrong with this menu? Um, take a wild guess, you've got two seconds. So it's actually completely illegible to a large number of people. And this surprises quite a few because depending on your personal sense of vision and so on, uh, that text may appear perfectly clear. Um, but if, as I'm sure you're all familiar, um, you look at the WCAG color contrast guidelines and you're expecting to meet about 4.5 out of one, that barely covers two. Um, and in fact, you might imagine a navigation like this basically being a, a blurry or indistinct mess, potentially to people with low vision. Now, if you were to look at common color options like I've just presented here, for examples, um, and imagine white text on those, a lot of people are quite surprised to find out just how much of a disparity there can be. Um, of those four examples, only the first one is actually clear enough to pass basic WCAG for regular text that you might find inside NAV. Um, the yellow you might not be too surprised about, but a lot of people find that that magenta at the bottom looks perfectly clear to them. Like, why would that possibly be a problem? But it is. And the truth is that there's no real way to get around this. You pretty much just have to use a tool to test it. Um, I'm simplifying a bit here as well. I'm sure you know this, but it's a 3, uh, sorry, 3 to 1 contrast for bold or large text, but you rarely have bold or large text in there. So I'm just going to call it 4.5. Anyway. Let's take a menu like this. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the concept of a hover state. So if you move a mouse over a menu option, you see some kind of change like this, right? Pretty standard. Most of us designed for that. Um, give some consideration to that. Um, less well known and less consistently implemented would be the focus state. So this is where you're actually selecting an element of, say, a navigation or a link or a form control, whatever, using a keyboard or using some form of accessible technology. Um, pretty much the majority of accessible technologies end up kind of being reduced to fundamentally reduced to keyboard navigation. So using the keyboard to browse a site is a good proxy to kind of get a feel for what they're like. Um, and when you are using a keyboard to browse a menu like this, you might see something along these lines where you can move up and down and just select options. Um, and you would hope to see a clear, unambiguous indicator of what you have selected. It's fairly obvious that if you didn't have that, you'd be stuffed. You couldn't do anything with that menu. Now, a common misunderstanding is that the focus state is the same as the hover state. It really isn't. They are completely separate concepts. Um, implementing one does not give you the other. And there's no reason why they have to be styled in the same way. In fact, there are many reasons why they shouldn't be styled in the same way. So let me quickly show you an example. This is gov.uk, which is my go-to great accessible website because they are great and accessible. Um, and if I was to look at their link styling, you would see their normal state for a link is what you see here on the left is a fairly standard blue and underline. Their hover state, a slightly thicker underline. So it's not just color, but they are mostly changing the color. So they make it slightly darker and they add a little bit more weight onto the, the hover just so that someone who couldn't pick out the color can still see the difference. Um, but the real focus here is the focus state and the focus state is substantially more distinct. Um, and this is what we recommend. Your focus states should stand out more. They can afford to. Your hover state, you probably don't want to look that extreme. A lot of people will find it off-putting or even kind of gross, but you can keep them completely separate. Um, as a lesson on what not to do, here's another website and I'll just show you their focus state. And I don't know if you noticed that, but there wasn't one. Um, they don't have focus states at all. And so as if, if I was to use a keyboard to step through every link on this page, I can't actually tell what I have selected. So as a result, that is fundamentally completely inaccessible by default. Um, it's a common mistake. And it's usually born of a little bit of code looks something like this. Um, the key, the key part is the outline none. So your browser will usually add some kind of border or outline to um, elements that are selected with focus. And a lot of old frameworks, um, CSS resetting libraries, that kind of thing, will tend to hide that. Um, a lot of web designers seem to think that this is some like ugly artifact they need to get rid of because it looks hideous. I mean, it's there for a really good reason. 
Um, so if you've got this, you definitely want to not remove it or you want to add some better substitute for it if you, uh, you know, if you've got something in mind, like, like GovUK added the yellow there, for example. So um, what is an acceptable focus? Well, I've got two examples here. On the left hand side, we have a very, very faint dashed border focus. So you can just about see that bananas is selected. And on the right hand side, uh, we have a extremely high contrast, you know, bright yellow, bl black, thick outline uh, focus state. So are these accessible? You can probably take a guess. Um, well, actually, under WCAG 2.1, they are both accessible because WCAG 2.1 doesn't say um, anything about how contrasting your focus needs to be, but that is about to change. In WCAG 2.2, which is pretty much final draft right now, in fact, they were expecting it to have come out in June, but still not quite here, but the, um, the, the current draft indicates specific requirements for what a focus state must look like and something like you have on the left would not pass so specifically because if you're curious and you should be because these this will become the new standard in a reasonably short time frame um wk 2.2 indicates you need to have a three to one color contrast so the contrast between whatever the focus is and the non-focus state there needs to be a three to one color contrast and in the part that contrasts three to one, it either needs to be a one pixel border around the whole edge or four pixels along the shortest edge, or you could potentially have something in between. So, um, so the example on the right hand side where you've got like a little green edge uh, would seem to comply with that. Um, it's actually a trick. It wouldn't because that green and the white, if you recall from an earlier slide, actually aren't three to one contrast. So that would in fact fail. Um, but anyway, a new one to bear in mind. So a quick recap of uh, how your navigation should look. Firstly, of course, your text must contrast clearly with backgrounds. Um, focus states should have high contrast and hover states, which can be separate, can be much more subtle. Uh, it's really a design thing. The hover state is not an accessibility requirement. It's more of a usability enhancement. And then WCAG 2.2 will soon enforce stricter requirements for focus contrast, so I recommend getting ahead of those. Right, so that's got us kicked off. Let's move on. Why is skipping navigation such a big, hairy deal? I mean, of course, we've all heard about it, skip to content and so forth, but why do we care? Well, this is a standard news article on BBC, and um, nothing particularly exceptional or unusual about this site if anything it's probably a bit cleaner and simpler than most new sites but if i was to get to the content i would have to step through 29 straightforward links before i could get there um, now you and i probably don't think about that if you're a sighted user you're probably just you know flicking your eyes down you don't even care but um, imagine for a second that requires physical labor to uh, bypass because if you're using say a screen reader or something this information is being read out to you you are actually having to step through each link one at a time so that's pretty laborious um, for some people it's a motor issue as well um, they don't necessarily have access to say a mouse um, or a touch screen they may be using uh, in this case this is a, a mouse stick and some form of um, keyboard or accessible buttons Again, as I said earlier, most physical accessible technology ends up essentially being equivalent to um, using a keyboard. So doing that with a keyboard is a pain. Um, and this is why skip to content matters. Uh, something like you're seeing here on GovUK, where if you press tab, you will see immediately a skip to main content link. It will be read out by, say, a screen reader like this. Um, and I'm going to use this pattern a lot. You're going to see speech bubbles like that all over this presentation. And I'm going to try and show you what a screen reader would say in these situations. So skip to main content link, pretty straightforward. Tap that and you bypass all of the nonsense in the middle. Um, minor note, I've seen some people get quite um, strongly opinionated on this, but as a general rule, I don't recommend showing the skip to content unless it is focused. There's a long series of philosophical debates about that, but generally I think it's um, unnecessary. And in particular, if you've got multiple skip links, which you may want to consider, um, it becomes quite verbose. 
uh, you'll find that most of the, the largest um, accessibility leaders still have hidden skipped content links, and that's just fine. Um, there's also a lesser known concept called a tab stop, which is also worth drawing attention to, and it, it falls into the same concept. So I've got a, uh, a US government website here, and their navigation, I'm, I'm using the keyboard again, so I, you can see my focus is on this first menu option, the all topics and services. And if I was to step through this with a keyboard, it would select these options in turn. So I could go backwards and forwards like this. Um, then if I was to press enter, say, I would expand the menu and then I could tab through the options inside that menu. Now, this seems pretty obvious, but it's actually significantly better than an experience that most websites will do. And in, it's important to understand why. Um, what they've done is they've made the tabs go through the high level options without expanding them. So if I go to about the US and then I want to go to the next option, I'm consistently navigating through the highest level. What you don't want to do is say tab to benefits, grants and loans, and it automatically expands. And then you have to tab through each one of these subordinate options. Um, you're multiplying by a huge factor the number of additional physical steps that a person has to do. And often that person may have a motor impairment or some other reason why that is, is prohibitively difficult. Um, note, this doesn't mean you can't have menus that you hover over, which open it like a mouse control is different. But if you're using keyboard access, you you generally you want to make opening the menu an explicit manual step. So to recap through that, always add a skipped content link or indeed links. If you have particularly intense navigation, you might want more than one. Uh, Wikipedia, for example, has a skip to content and they also have a skip to search which is often quite a good paradigm. Um, generally keep it invisible until focused and be sure to minimize your tab stops. So if you have a tab, uh, sorry, no, if you're pressing tab, it should not expand content uh, automatically. Right, let's take a quick look at how your navigation should be structured. So I found this quote a while back. Um, <laughs> Accessibility is usually seen as a problem for people who code and people who pick colors, not information architects. Now, believe it or not, she's actually advocating information architects should care about this problem. The funny thing with that quote is you could pretty much swap out information architects for anyone. You could swap it out for managers or leaders or content writers or graphic designers or whatever. But um, it's true, a lot of people see accessibility as someone else's problem. Um, I want to show you a little bit about information architecture from an accessibility angle. So what do we even mean by information architecture? Well, for our purposes here, let's just take this simple fictional website. Um, it's kind of designing the structure um, of the site. It's designing things like, you know, what might my top level nav be and my sub nav be? What do I label my menu options? Um, how do I group them, structure them, et cetera? Um, and the field covers more than that, but for now, we're just going to focus on this part. So what you see here is a classic and pretty well-designed uh, vanilla website. Um, you know it's well-designed because you don't have to think about it. It's so ludicrously banal and obvious that just about everything on the page makes sense automatically. Um, and think about how you kind of take this for granted until it's not there. Um, you know that clicking on fruit kind of opens that menu below it. You know um, that the options on the left affects what you see on the right. Um, and you know what that breadcrumb is. You know that breadcrumb is saying, oh, there's a home page, and inside that there's fruit, and inside that there's bananas. Um, in fact, all of these uh, elements here are kind of echoing each other. They're sort of overlapping in the fact that they like reaffirm where you are, um, what the links do. Um, and then consider how the labels are pretty obvious, right? I'm inside fruit and I've got apples, bananas, oranges. Um, you could imagine that if I clicked on vegetables, you can pretty much guess what would happen, even though it's never been designed. You would know automatically. That's actually useful for your users. It's also useful for your own team because as you're building a website, it helps to have a structure where it's so obvious where things go that you don't have to think about it. Now, let's contrast that with if I did it badly. So some really trivial changes. I'm just going to mess with some text labels, but um, I'm now going to rename fruit to SBS or seed bearing structures, which might be the internal 
uh, terminology that they would use in the industry, but it's definitely not something that their average user would understand or relate to. Um, might seem a little bit contrived, but surprisingly common to see this where people take something as simple as search and they want to rename it to quick search or omni search or whatever, um, because internally that's what they think of. And you don't care about what you think of internally, you care about what your users think of. So um, that's just being obtuse really, it's just being obscure for no reason other than you can't think otherwise. Um, the structure at the top, of course, makes less sense. Previously, when you had fruit and vegetables adjacent, it made sense. You could see, ah, fruit and vegetables, that's like a pairing. You can sort of imagine selecting. But once you've got SBS and other plants, you don't really know what's going on unless you think about it. And likewise, contact, which is fairly self-evident, is now organization and presumably somewhere in there it's got contact. But it's not the thing that a person is thinking about doing or understanding or wanting. Organization is probably not what they're, they're looking for. Um, and then the options on the left, I made a very, very minor tweak here. But if you look on the first example where it's done properly, you've got the grouping of apples, bananas, oranges, and pears, and it's logically contained. There's a set of four that makes sense. They're all, they belong, right? So they're clearly a set of items. And you can imagine choosing those and immediately understanding what's going on. Um, but when I scrambled them a bit, I've just mixed in the colors option. So previously that was divided off by a line at the bottom. But if I just mash it in there and I don't care, um, now it's, re it's the same items, but it's so much harder to figure out what's going on because your brain goes colors. OK, I don't know what that even means. And then it's bananas, apples, pears, oranges. And so just that simple separation and ordering makes a big difference. Also, really subtle here, but in the previous design, you had those ordered alphabetically, apples, bananas, oranges, pears. And here they're just in any random order. That doesn't mean you should order everything alphabetically. Um, that was just an example of having a consistency behind a navigation. It might make more sense to do it, say, by, I don't know, the most prominent fruit first or whatever. But as long as there's a pattern and it's ideally it's self-evident. So there are certain cognitive considerations to consider here from an accessibility standpoint. Um, a big problem users report when they're being manually tested on this is that information is not on a page where users expect. Um, typically, that comes down to the architecture being wrong. So you've got some weird site structure where you've just decided you're going to put whatever in the top menu. And as a result, no one can find anything. Um, having too much information is a real problem. And you'll see that sites like GovUK and many others um, typically break out what would have been a big navigation structure, like a mega menu. And they typically break it into separate pages and make those pages more explicit. But yeah, your mileage may vary. Inconsistent structure, as we saw, and then I'd like to draw particular attention to variable reading ability, in particular dyslexia. So let's take that page again, and I'm just going to pretend this is a crude simulation, but um, pretend you have dyslexia. So one approximate for dyslexia is to imagine the letters are scrambled. It's not quite like this, but it'll do for our purposes. So you can see the page and you can you can still read it just about. I mean, if you look hard, you can kind of figure out what all those words are, but uh, you just have to think about it a bit more. Uh, and that's kind of what's going on inside the head of a lot of people who either have, um, say, dyslexia or many other forms of cognitive impairment, or maybe English is the second language or whatever. There's so many variations of that. But um, in particular with dyslexia, a really useful aid is simply to add decorative elements. Um, which is often not said in accessibility. People seem to think that decorative elements are like a, a bad idea, you know, like you get rid of them and we only want the functional stuff. But um, especially if you've got something like dyslexia, uh, having a simple visual affordance like a picture of your fruit here makes it so much easier to actually understand what's going on because the text may not be clear to you, but a visual like this will be. Um, and likewise, consider maybe a visual affordance on the right. Uh, you might take it for granted that you've landed on the bananas page because you know how to skin this site. You've seen it a thousand times. But someone who doesn't know they've landed on the right page and is desperate to know they're in the right place might really appreciate a picture of a banana that underscores the fact that the text is saying you're on the banana page. So something to bear in mind. Right, so now for the majority of what we're going to now go through is going to be some actual code. So um, I, I warn you, it's not going to be too crazy, but we are going to go into some HTML. We are going to go into a little bit of CSS and JavaScript, tiny, tiny bit. Um, and we're going to begin 
by going into more than you could possibly imagine ever wanting to know about breadcrumbs. Uh, you'd be surprised how much you can do with breadcrumbs. And what do we mean by breadcrumb? We mean this. So common, super simple design pattern. So basic, we probably don't even think about it. But I want to show you a few sides to something as simple as this that we're then going to expand and use for other more complicated forms of navigation. So let's get started. The first thing is you want to wrap your navigation inside a nav tag. Now, sometimes there's confusion over this. Some people have used things like div with a role of navigation. Sometimes people have used nav with a role of navigation. Definitely don't do that. Um, nav is a HTML5 element, which means it's the only thing you should use, basically, because no one's using anything older than HTML5 now. Um, and nav is equivalent to saying role navigation. There's no need to add the redundant code. Um, but what does that even mean? It's a landmark. Right. So, but why do we care? Like, all right, sure, I've heard these tags. What, what is, how does that actually help anyone? Right. So, let's take a look at um, browsing with an accessible uh, assistive technology. So, this is VoiceOver uh, on a Mac on the left hand side, and it's on a admittedly very old iPhone on the right. Um, and landmarks are a means of navigating a page if you're using assistive tech. So, if you've never done this, by the way, you really should familiarize yourself with using a screen reader because you already have one on your phone. It doesn't matter if you're using iOS or Android. Um, just take five minutes and, and learn the one that you've already got. But um, a common um, interaction is to say, I want to browse through the landmarks on the page. And then you can have them read out to you or shown to you. So like on the left hand side here, there are landmarks like skip to main content, complementary, banner, site search, search, etc. You'll notice these landmarks have pretty terrible names. That's surprisingly common, like what on earth is site search, search, main and main menu navigation. Not, not the best, but um, nevertheless, the beauty of a landmark is it lets you skip to parts of a page really, really quickly. Um, now, the problem with that is you really need to make sure you add a label, because if you just add a nav element and you've got more than one nav element, well, that list you just saw a minute ago, would just say nav, 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 which is not very useful. So you need to add a label. Um, and one really easy way of doing this is just aria-label and then give it a name. Um, and that will be read out as something like breadcrumb navigation. Now, the problem with this is landmarks are wonderful technology and everyone likes to talk about how great they are, but Unfortunately, most screen reader users still don't use them that much. Um, there's a survey here of uh, what screen reader users actually use. And although uh, landmarks are there, they're 3.9%, they're second from bottom. The first, <clears throat> the primary way of navigating through a page with a screen reader is through headings. Um, it kind of makes sense. I think it's because so many websites do headings and relatively few do landmarks correctly. And also maybe there's some bias here that this is like, you know, um, older websites and older tech and hopefully we get better over time. But um, the side effect is you want a heading as well. Um, and headings work in the same way. So if someone's using some kind of screen reading technology, they're going to get a list of headings and they can just select the ones they want. So with something like a Wikipedia article, they'll just click here, select. So recommended pattern is to have your landmark nav and then include within it a heading. Mark that heading as screen reader only. So that's my class equals SR only. That's just a standard class. You, you can find your own. I'm sure you've all got your own, uh, which just makes an element for screen reader um, only by positioning it off screen. Um, and so you don't actually have a visible heading there, but if someone's using their assistive tech and they're skipping through the headings or they're skipping through the landmarks, either way they will find, in this case, breadcrumb, which is a really handy way of them getting to the navigation that they care about. Um, so I'm sure you've all seen this a thousand times inside your navigation. You're going to have, in this case, an ordered list. So usually in navigation you have unordered lists. In this case, because it's a breadcrumb, the order actually matters. So I would say an OL in this case, but straightforward OL, LI, link. I'm sure you've seen this a billion times. Something you may not have seen, however, um, is indicating where you're actually at. So if you've got a breadcrumb, it's quite common for the last option to indicate the current page. 
And you may not know this, but there's a uh, attribute aria current, which can specify that a link or piece of text or whatever you want is actually your current location. And that will be read out to the user, something like this. So bananas link current location. Um, this is a recommended WCAG technique. Um, it helps users, especially of assistive technologies, actually understand where they are. Because you might take it for granted. You look at that and you go, well, I'm not going to click on bananas, am I? Because that's where I'm at. But deprived of visual context, that's not obvious. So this helps. The other thing you've got here, the last thing, is you've got these decorative elements, these uh, dividers, if you will, between the, the options. Now, uh, you very much need them for sighted users, because otherwise this is a bit of a blur. But there's so many ways you can code this, and most of them are wrong. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want some kind of readable separator. You don't want something that's going to get spoken out loud. Um, so something like this would read out as apples link greater than, bananas link greater than, and that's really confusing. It just doesn't really make sense. It's detracting from what's actually going on. Um, so you could just add um, a span around that and apply the magical aria-hidden true, which takes anything inside it and it removes it from being, uh, well, it removes it from the accessible DOM, which basically means it's not gonna get read out. A even better way would be just to do it with CSS, but take your pick. Whew. Right, so that's quite a lot. Uh, so I hope you you stood with that for a while. Um, I'm going to show you, however, that most of what I just went through is actually going to scale up to much, much more complicated navigation forms. Um, if you look at the kind of the finished result, uh, what, have, what have we actually got here? Well, we've got something that's easy to find, right? So we've got the, the landmark nav and we've got headings, so it's easy to skip through the page. Um, it's clearly labeled because you've got that, that breadcrumb inside the um, labeled element. Um, easy to skip past. So because it's inside a um, landmark and also because you've got a, an ordered list, screen readers and assistive tech will generally provide options to skip those things really easily. So that's really helpful. Um, and it works everywhere. This will work in anything. This will work on like Internet Explorer 5 or something crazy. So um, it's great. Like simple technology is probably the best if you can. And it does make the current page clear. That area current is, uh, again, a really useful help for, for many people. And you'll see that the concepts we just established, we're going to repeat. So wrapping inside nav, labeling, plain links, aria hidden, aria current. You're going to see those a lot. So let's go on to some more examples and see how this, this scales up. We can have some fun to start with, with a classic one dimensional menu. So that would be something like this. So a one dimensional menu is just a strip, right? There's no drop downs or anything here. So just imagine a series of sequential uh, menu options. Um, and typically you'll want to have um, some indicator that you've got a currently selected option. Um, that's just generally a good principle, by the way. You should do that visually as well as with assistive tech. Um, as well as uh, you might have some icons in there or say like you know, a logo in the top left. In this case, I've got a picture of a home, but all the same really. So the way to code this is actually going to look very, very familiar because it's almost exactly the same as what we just did with breadcrumbs. Um, you've got the nav, you've got the heading, um, the link between the two, and you've got um, an ordered list. Actually, this does make sense because it is ordered. Um, and then just some tiny things that are different. Um, because we've got a home icon in this case, uh, it was an emoji actually, um, we're using Aria Hidden to hide that. You definitely don't want to read out your emojis. Um, you don't, Generally, you want to be, if you've got like decorative icons and so on, you want to make sure that those things have Aria Hidden on them. Um, and then we add something. We're adding a SR only span here to read out some text for people who wouldn't otherwise get that uh, visual element. And again, this is a pattern you're going to use a thousand times. Then we have aria current again, which you saw a minute ago with the breadcrumb, but there's a weird aria quirk here. Um, when you're using something like um, a breadcrumb, we used aria current equals location. And that says that this is the current location. When we're in a navigation like this, we want to say aria current equals page. And I have to be honest, if you ask me, this is aria being stupid. And it doesn't help 
that ARIA's documentation for this is actually wrong. Um, if you look up the official docs for those uh, two options, you'll find that one of them is actually copy and pasted from something completely unrelated and doesn't even make any sense. So that doesn't help. But the general consensus appears to be that when you have a list of links, you should use page, so a menu like this. And if you've got some other form of context that isn't like so much a menu as it's like explaining where you are, like a breadcrumb, you would use location. And that's it. That's you've just done a menu. So it's basically the same as pagination, to be honest. It was pretty straightforward. Um, all right, let's see if we can do something a little bit trickier. Sorry, not pagination. It was the same as a breadcrumb, I should say. Now we'll do pagination. So pagination is where you have something like this. You might have search results um, or some other uh, long list, maybe blog articles, and you'll typically have a, a series of page numbers um, at the bottom, often displayed in a format like this, along with perhaps some kind of icons that go you know, back or uh, forward, potentially go back to the start or to the end or advance, like maybe a block of 10 numbers in one go. This is a very, very common UI pattern. Um, and as such, it needs to be made accessible. Problem is, um, imagine it's being read out naively. You might get something like this. You might get a double left arrow link, or you might get three link, or you might get faint gray double left arrow link if you've got something disabled. Um, this doesn't make sense. In fact, this whole component is kind of a hard thing to get your head around unless you have the visual affordances to understand what's going on. So how do we deal with that? Well, you need your links to make sense in isolation. So the first easy thing to do is to come back to our old friend SR only. So this is some screen reader only text, and we're just going to decorate this a little bit. We're going to add the word page in front of the page number. So instead of just saying one or two as a link, we're going to say page one link, page two. Simple, straightforward, has no effect on the visual appearance of the component, but makes it significantly more accessible. And then we're going to do um, something extra when you've got disabled links. So we're going to add ARIA disabled. So you can, of course, just you could have like a button that's, you know, previous set of pages or whatever and say disabled previous set of pages or, you know, um, not available or whatever. But as a general rule, it's kind of more semantic and discoverable to use ARIA dash disabled as a way of just indicating that a control um, is currently unavailable. If this was a button, you would use disabled. You wouldn't use aria dash disabled, but because it's a link, you haven't got a choice. So, and that was it. That was also really easy. You'll see um, the simple pattern that we established earlier on actually scales up really well. There's not actually that much more to it. It's just understanding how it can be applied. So let's do something a little trickier. Let's have a drop down button. Uh, so this is a pretty standard thing. You often have these in mobile navigations. Uh, say a hamburger uh, nav would be something like this. Uh, you might have this as some kind of table of contents in the corner of a page, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the standard pattern is you have a button and pressing the button will open up a series of links and then you can click on a link to go there. Straightforward. How do we code it? Well, again, this is going to look very, very familiar, but there are some slight changes here. Um, I should point out that I've actually started to remove the header to an ARIA labeled by it at the start. I've just done nav, and I've done that just to keep the code a little bit shorter here, but you should still add those things. Um, the real focus here is firstly, you've got a button, um, and it's very important that it's a button. It's not enough just to make this a link or a div or a span or whatever other element. The semantics here are going to matter a lot. If you change that, it won't work. Um, and we have a button, and then below it, we have an unordered list. Um, that's hidden. And we're going to go through this step by step, but the, the idea essentially is the button is the visual part and tapping it will open up the invisible options. So why does it matter that it is a button? Well, in my experience, people get these confused or, or have maybe never stopped to think about them, but there's a significant distinction between, say, an A tag and a button. Um, a tags with HTML5 onwards are exclusively reserved for things that navigate to a page. That is all they do. They never, ever, ever do anything else. They do not definitively, uh, an, an A tag is not a button. It is not something that, for example, saves or searches or whatever. It is literally 
an element that is supposed to have a href that points to another page and it goes there. And this matters because you get things like right clicking on a tags, you get things like search engines crawl a tags, um, you get things like um, bookmarking, and of course you get assistive technology that reads them out as links. Um, the idea of a link is it's meant to not perform an action. It's meant to be safe. It never modifies the site. It doesn't do anything scary. A button, on the other hand, specifically performs an action and is generally expected not to navigate you. Um, so in theory, like, of course, it can result, you know, a result of a button can be it navigates you somewhere like you would click on login, for example. But um, you're not clicking on the login button to go to the login page. You're clicking the login button to log in. So that's this kind of semantic distinction. Now, in your code, it matters because buttons are treated differently. They have different attributes. They have different behaviors. And in particular, with accessibility, they have behaviors that we care about here. So we've got this button, and we're adding aria-expanded to it. And what this does is it indicates that a button, and only a button, is either open or closed. You can't have an open or closed link. You can't have an open or closed div. You've got an open or closed button. So um, this is a concept built into ARIA that indicates that um, the button is open or shut, as it were, and it will be read out to the user. So um, this is a standard simple thing. It's not complicated. You will need, as you'll see, a little bit of code, of course, to update it. And then the other thing we've got here is this ARIA controls attribute. And ARIA controls is really useful, but annoyingly is only supported by JAWS, um, probably will be to the end of time. Um, the JAWS is the most common screen reader, but still it's not, certainly you're not gonna get close to 50% coverage for this, but it, it is generally worth adding um, because JAWS users kind of expect it, whereas non-JAWS users won't notice. And, and what it does is it links your button here to the options. So if you look at this, ARIA controls is set to options. And here, the UL has an ID of options. And so what this is basically saying is, if I open up this button, can you set the focus to this list? Um, and that is something that would be expected more in JAWS, not so much in other screen readers. Um, of course, you could try and do this with JavaScript. But again, it's very best to follow the conventions of the specific screen reader someone's using. Now, because other screen readers don't do it, what they'll do instead is you'll press the button, it will say something like menu open or menu expanded or whatever, depending on the screen reader. And then they'll need to tab or step forward to the next element, which will be the UL. And because of that, it really matters. This button needs to be directly before the UL. OK, and then uh, lastly, we add hidden to hide the closed menu. This is basically a semantically nicer form of display none. Uh, the primary advantage, though there are many, is you don't need to wait for your CSS to load. It just hides it. So if your CSS is taking a while, this will still be hidden. Um, and then we add a bit of JavaScript. I'm not going to go through all that. It's not that complicated if you know JavaScript. But we're basically saying check if the button is clicked. If it is, we, we change ARIA expanded to be the opposite of what it is. And we change the hidden to be the opposite of what it is. So. Um, if you look at this, what you'd end up with is if you click on this button, we show or hide the options and we indicate that the expanded is either true or false. And the result is, again, something that is easy to find, clearly labeled, has a single tab stop, as we saw earlier, how important that is. It works everywhere and it's pretty easy to use. I mean, look at it, like that is the easiest thing in the world to apply CSS to. That is it's what you want, right? It doesn't have 4,000 ARIA attributes. It doesn't have 40K of JavaScript libraries and so on. It's just straightforward. And that's something good to strive for. OK, so lastly, let's have a look at a full drop down menu to raise our brief sense of joy. <sighs> well, at least I'm honest. Um, so a full drop down menu would be something like this. So this is where you've got a list of menu options, maybe at the top. And as you tab through them, you would see a list of subordinate options and potentially subordinate subordinate options and so on. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is what you don't do. So I've seen this time and time again. Um, for whatever reason, people seem to think they need to use role or specifically menu roles. So you'll see something like this, role equals menu, role equals menu item. 
Um, if you ever see this, uh, someone is wrong and you should uh, tell them that they're wrong or if it's you, I'm, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Um, this is a really, really, really common and tragically bad thing to do. And I'm going to briefly explain why. Um, menu roles are not what you think they are. Um, menu roles are specifically and exclusively designed for web applications. So this is Google Docs. Google Docs has a very good reason to use menu role. They have a menu at the top that looks much like you might see a menu in, say, Microsoft Word. So it's a, a, a classic menu you use, you know, uh, potentially you've got layers in there. Um, you can scroll through the options. You can um, go into subordinate options. You can escape from the menu and so on. Um, you may not realize the subtlety of what's happening when you use that menu role, but essentially what's happening is the screen reader swaps into a different mode. And the screen reader then expects you and will communicate to the user that they are in this kind of application mode, if you will. And they are then expecting to be able to use all of these keyboard shortcuts, and actually a few more, to be able to navigate the menu in a way that is consistent with um, any normal application, but not consistent with a website. So again, if I'm using Microsoft Word, I expect that I can use the cursor keys to go through the menu items. I can press escape to come out of them. Um, but if I am, I can use space to select one, right? But if I'm in a web browser and I press space, I expect it to scroll me down. If I use up and down cursor keys, I expect it to scroll me up or down. So you've changed the interface paradigm. Worse, you have to program all of this. You have to either bring in a complicated library or you have to write your own JavaScript that can handle all of these keyboard events and make it cross browser. And why on earth would you do any of this? Because this, none, none, of, uh, none of this is necessary. The ARIA role menu is specifically and exclusively designed for web apps. So basically, unless you are writing like Google Docs or something, you don't ever use it. Unfortunately, 90% of the time, I've seen that well-meaning developers add ARIA um, because they've read some tutorial or they've Googled something or they found a little code snippet. And unfortunately, they end up making their website less accessible. Um, most of ARIA you don't want to use but there's a handful of things I'm showing you today do make sense, but you should only really be using it if you actually know what it does. Um, so what should we do instead? Well, it's actually quite a lot simpler. Um, here's a design pattern. I'll give you that link again, and of course there will be a recording here, but um, this is a, a sort of ready-made example. There are many others. Um, that goes to great lengths to um, assert its accessibility. And uh, there's quite a lot of um, explanation as to what's going on as well. So you might want to, again, check out that link. Um, and it starts off with one simple distinction, which is often overlooked and is, is worth diving into, which is um, when you have like a multi-layered navigation like this, should you have links for the top level pages? So you've got things like about and blog and services here. Should those be links? Um, or are they just, you know, buttons that you press that show links inside them? There's no right answer here. Um, it partly comes down to your architecture, um, but quite a few sites, including oddly enough, uh, Silk Tides, will will actually have um, a dedicated page for those top level links. So they'll have an about page, as you would see it here, or a blog page, um, and then they'll also have some form of um, expansion so you can kind of go into the menu and explore the options within. Now, um, there are pros and cons to this, but generally having a sort of shallower nav, if you will, so not needing to dive into those extra options um, is great if, for example, a user doesn't have JavaScript because they can't go into that menu. Um, if you're looking at search engines, it can be a more appropriate landing page. Um, if you're just thinking about it conceptually, it's almost easier to share things like here's my blog or here's my about page than it is to share some of those specific pages. Um, and what you typically end up with is something like this. So this is an about the US page. That is a expandable dropdown, but you can still go to the about the US page. And the, the page that you're seeing here is essentially a long form version of what is inside that menu. It's a great way of potentially reducing the cognitive burden of your menu as well. It just means there's less stuff to, to look at. Um, so the code is very similar. So again, you've got a nav, you've got a UL, you've got an LI. The main difference here is your nesting things. So you've now got a UL LI, and inside that you've got a UL LI, which I'm sure you've seen before. Um, in this particular example, we've got a link to the page, 
And you've also got a button to expand those options. So if you looked back at the mock-up here, you've got about as a link, and then you've got some kind of icon to expand it. Again, that's not to everyone's taste, it may not be suitable for you, but that's the way it's done here. And if you only wanted to do one, you just remove the other. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, one little subtlety here that's kind of cute, maybe you want to consider this. Um, they're using ARIA labeled by with, um, it's, it's actually quite unusual. So ARIA labeled by lets you say some other element labels this element. And what they've done here is you can actually specify multiple elements. So they've actually said this button is labeled by itself. So BTN item two. And it's also labeled by item two, which is the text link before it. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't actually worry about that too much. Um, it's just kind of cute if you happen to be doing a pairing of uh, items like this. But um, essentially, that would end up saying things like show about, hide about as your link. Um, and you don't need to do this, but it isn't bad practice adding support for the escape button because that's generally not something you, you don't need to worry about someone pressing escape on your web page for any other reason but if you add support for escape in a menu like this which is pretty straightforward um it can make the user experience better just again imagine you're using tab browsing or some other keyboard access and you're trapped several levels deep in the menu it's a lot easier to press escape to go out than it is to kind of go next 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 and so on um, and again, there's that link to that code. So if you want the full code, because there's quite a bit more here than I could go through to today, uh, check that out. Phew. Right. OK. Hopefully you're still with me. We'll wrap up shortly. So a quick recap. Um, how it looks. So we pointed out that text must contrast clearly with its background. Focus states need to have high contrast. Hover states can be much more subtle. And WCAG 2.2 will soon enforce uh, specific requirements for focus. We looked at skipping nav, uh, so make sure, of course, you add a skipped content link, keep it visible until it's focused, and particularly, because people miss this one, minimize the number of tab stops. So you shouldn't expand menus when you tab onto them. We looked quite a bit at site architecture and just considered some things like um, affordances, like, say, visual um, decoration here for, say, dyslexic users, um, as well as just keeping your information architecture logical and consistent and grouping related items together visually um, on the page. And then we looked at a lot of code. And like uh, as I mentioned earlier on, the high level things that we hit with that uh, breadcrumb are pretty much the same things we hit everywhere else. So you want to be using a nav landmark. You want to label it. You want to put plain links inside it. You want to use ARIA hidden or CSS to decorate things and ARIA current to indicate the current page. So that is almost everything. Just a quick note, how would you test all of this? So there's a few suggestions. Um, firstly, you should always use a keyboard. If you don't do this already, <clears throat> just get into the habit. Excuse me. <clears throat> just get into... Oh, I need a drink. One second. <clears throat> just get into the habit of using keyboard navigation. Uh, so that would be pressing tab or shift and tab and either enter or space to select things. Um, really good proxy for a lot of accessible tech, dead easy. Um, secondly, use a screen reader. You'll already have one. If you've got a phone, you've got either VoiceOver or the Android equivalent. Um, and please work with disabled users and also please pay them uh, for their time. But uh, they're the best source of insight and inspiration and just understanding generally. Um, they'll tell you things you can't even imagine you didn't know. And then we provide a free screen reader simulator, which is at silktie.com slash toolbar. You can see a little bit of a picture of it here. Um, the idea is this basically simulates the high level, simulates the process you would have in a screen reader. So you can step through parts of a page and instead of having them read out uh, to you, you can actually kind of see them in this little panel. It's quite useful. Uh, it can speak to you as well if you want. Of course, I'm sure everyone on this call already knows this, but Silktide generates the Silktide Index, which is a public leaderboard or uh, websites in many, many sectors. Uh, we make a point of showing the best performing websites uh, in any area for accessibility. That, of course, does cover the UK public sector. Um, and we are also very careful not to shame people who aren't at the top. So it's very much a look at how everyone is doing really well. Um, or if you want to search for your own uh, organization, you can find it in there and see how you perform. And of course, we build a platform for automatically monitoring and helping you to improve your 
website, which has a significant focus on accessibility. So things like you see here, where you can see your accessibility by level, your most common issues and so on. And we make a big deal out of showing you issue, issues visually and testing them across a range of devices, including uniquely to us mobile. So that's Silk Tide, um, and that's me for today. I'm going to leave, I think we've got about five minutes or so for some questions. Um, this webinar and more like it can be found at silktie.com slash webinars. Of course, this particular webinar needs to be packaged up, captioned and so forth. So it will probably take a few days for that to happen, but you can check it out on that address um, and you can see many more like it from the same place. OK, let's uh, let's see what questions we have, if indeed any. Nothing in the chat for now. OK, nothing in the chat. I love it. I'm off. Thank you very much, guys. No. Um, well, I'll give you a couple minutes. Just in case anyone wants to bring anything up. You can either raise your hand or put something in a chat. I don't believe I can see chat. Is that right? You should be able to. OK. I am obviously less familiar with uh, teams. Oh, wait, hold on. I've got participants. Someone's raising their hand. Paul, how does that Hello. work? Um, hey. I'm quite interested in how does accessibility work with extraneous use of modals, uh, chat clients, and uh, over any kind of overlays on screens. Whew. Well, that's almost a webinar in itself. But the okay. um, <laughs> no, no. So I'll, I'll give you a quick answer. Um, so yeah, you do need to do things carefully. There's a lot of pitfalls people fall into. Like, um, do you remember earlier on I showed you? I think the University of Wales, I believe. Don't want to pick on them, but just to show you, because um, actually it's it's a pretty good example. So I'm going to quickly share my screen again. Um, just tell me you can see my screen, right? I'm assuming. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Um, it's okay. Great, so I'm just going to nuke my cookies because obviously I've been here before. One second. So if I was to go here, so they have a modal, right? This is what you don't want to do. So this modal appears and you need to click on this to access the content, but because of the way they've written it, this modal is placed at the very end of their document. So I have to press tab something like 50 times. I don't think you can even see that in the bottom left corner. There's no visual way of seeing what's going on because it's all blanked out. So I'm having to tab, tab, tab like crazy. And I think if I press this about 50 something times, I eventually will get into that modal. Um, this is obviously a complete accessibility fail of the highest order. But um, yeah, you, you need to do things like set focus explicitly. Um, there are ways of doing that. You need to obviously provide some kind of indication of where you're actually at. There are some more complicated discussions as to things like blocking I see I can't even I can't even select it right now I don't know how to get there but um yeah uh there are ways to block access to parts of the page sometimes that's a good idea usually it isn't uh with things like cookie banners in particular um a lot of that comes down to doing things like uh the right html landmark so you typically want something complementary like a region or an aside I should say um and you'll you need to think about the order of that in your dom so you need to go i've got a cookie banner that probably needs to go at the top of my page not at the bottom um i don't mean physically at the top of the page i just mean it needs to be in the ordered in your code in the top of your page if that makes sense but like i said you could literally do a webinar on that topic so maybe i will okay i'm glad it's complicated thank you no problem Oliver, we have two questions in the chat. I'm not sure if you can see them. And one comment from Andy. Thank you very much. OK, I can't see chat. I don't know how to. to OK, be honest. one second. Can you see this now? Yeah, I can even see myself as well. Uh -huh. uh, that's intimidating. Um, <laughs> I'm more of a UX designer than a coder. So how hover and focus states will work on mobile phones? OK, right. So um hover state does not apply to mobile so the idea of hover is it was actually an internet explorer 6 thing if i remember like a little decorative nicety um it's nice to know that if you move your mouse over an element that you can click on it or not but it has no effect on mobile um, on the other hand focus definitely does so if you're using um certain assistive technologies on your phone like say voiceover or whatever it will select there are there are other um 
equivalents. You may not know this. You can take things like uh, push button interfaces. So that's where you literally have a single physical button or maybe a couple of physical buttons. And say you are uh, sufficiently disabled that you maybe are only able to move from, say, the neck up, right? So you might have a button on the back of your chair um, that you can press. And when you're doing that, that actually wires through to your mobile phone and lets you step through the items on the screen. When that happens, you're using the focus. So the focus always, always matters. The hover is decorative, basically. It's nice to have. Um, OK, so that was one. Uh, quick question about the appearance of Chevron drop downs or accordions as do not show up on high contrast screen. Um, OK, I'm not quite sure what the question is, though. <laughs> Just a quick question about the appearance. Um, so when you say a high contrast screen, I think what you mean is there's often a high contrast mode on your device. So if you're using, say, Windows, you can enable high contrast mode for all of Windows. Um, that, again, it's almost a error in itself. Um, GovUK has a really good, I'm sure you've all seen this, but GovUK has a really good um, design system, GDS design system, which I recommend looking at. They dealt with this problem a lot. Surprisingly tricky. I think you want to look at their, I think if I got this right, it's their back button component, which I think has what seems like the simplest problem in the world, which is a component that goes back. And that's all it does. It's just a link with an icon. But it turns out that's really hard, and they, they tackle that specific problem, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't have a question, but I just want to say thanks. Oh, that's very, very kind. Thank you. Um, brilliant talk. OK, I'm, it's a bit blurry, so I'm struggling to read the text. Does the focus background color need to contrast both with the white background on page and text color? No, so the, the background, in, um, at least for the moment, the background color needs to contrast with the text. <clears throat> so in other words, if you have, say, black text on a white background, it's the difference between those two colors. But then if the menu itself is, say, over a light gray background, that isn't a requirement um, because the theory would be that you can still discern the content of the menu, and it should be evident that it is a menu. Um, it's kind of the same reason why, um, for example, links should generally be distinguished through, say, underline. So they shouldn't just be different colors. They should also be underlined. But the exception to that is when you have a um, link inside a clear menu, because when people see links at the top of the screen in a certain way, they go, oh, well, it's obviously a menu. So it doesn't need to be shown as a link. So a bit of nuance in there, but yeah. Um, OK, I think that's it for questions, right? Yes, no more questions in the chat. Brilliant. OK, well, that works out as exactly one hour. So I think that's a good time to stop. Thank you very much for your time, guys. I hope you uh, found it useful. Again, check out supertight.com slash webinars if you want to see any more like this. Uh, we have quite a few more you can browse through. OK, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye bye.